All right, good morning to another educational grand rounds. Uh, today we'll be talking about what we all commonly share, which is addictions. Uh, we are habitual to something that we like, and we keep on doing it, even though we may know doing it in excess may not be necessary, but we keep doing it. So who knows how to define addiction? Um, addiction is impaired uh, control over our use. You become um, kind of dependent on it and compulsive. Um, you have physiological and psychological dependence. Okay. What would be physiological dependence? The withdrawal symptoms that you get if you don't have whatever you're addicted to. So then it's like the physical response of your body that makes you want to get more of whatever you're addicted to. Okay. And what are some of the things that people can get addicted to, Amir? Uh, people can get addicted to alcohol, narcotics, uh, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, uh, different hallucinogens mm -hmm. um, such as LSD. And there's a couple more, but I can't think of Sure. Them. So there are, these are some of the chemicals uh, that we can get addicted mm -hmm. to. And what do we see in our office a lot more here? What kind of addictions do we treat here? Uh, we treat uh, narcotics, uh, people who are um, can be depressed with the, um, the alcohol and uh, using alcohol, different yeah. drugs. And, uh, Okay, so drugs, including alcohol or narcotics, mm -hmm. that's a very common thing. All right, so having said that, are there other addictions outside of the chemicals that we generally think are addicting molecules? Mm -hmm. What other addictions are there? People can be addicted to certain behaviors in yeah. like other things like food or eating. Absolutely, food. So in the present day time, even though we don't categorize them as addictions, I do believe that uh, there are addictive chemicals in our foods which make us very much addicted to certain foods. Do right? okay. you have any addictions? Not that you have to share. Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> I, I get very bad coffee withdrawal. Very bad withdrawal. Right, yeah. So let's kind of fess up to our own addiction. We also will you know, get you into that cycle too, Jamie. What addictions do you have that you struggle with? What addictions do I struggle with? I struggle with trying to stop from telling my children what to do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Does that thing resonate with you? <laughs> do you hear somebody speaking in your ear and then and then you say, ah, oh, leave me alone. 24-7. 24-7, you know, it's just an <laughs> ever. <it's laughs> but are, are there any addictions that you're struggling with? Uh, I addic my addiction is um, electronics. Electronics, yes. So we are making it a lot more common, our addiction to electronics such as? <laughs> Television, uh, different computers, anything. Movies I'm more addicted to. Movies addiction. So we have a detox from movies as well <laughs> that we will talk about later on. What are your addictions? Um, I'd have to say TV as well and some foods. <laughs> some foods, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody should be laughing. We all have addiction. So if, if people are, this is a confession stand as well. <laughs> 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 we are confessing to our addiction. Then I'll make a point in a moment. Uh, you have any addiction? Chocolate. Chocolate addiction, yeah. So uh, we have a chocolate anonymous group going on, right? That's a possibility. <laughs> <That's> possible. <laughs> um, so my family tells me I'm addicted to planning a lot of things, that I am always doing something. And my mind is thinking, uh, so when you left on that, you have that addiction as well, it seems, right? Addiction <laughs> to ideas. Ideas, I know. I want to do this, I want to do that. You know? So we have many things that we do, and we do it in access, right? You know, so it's becoming aware of that. The reason I kind of bring it up in that manner is you know, that sometimes we think of them and us as if somebody else has addiction, then we don't, and we all have some or the other addiction, right? You know, addiction doesn't have to be always, quote, 
bad things, they can be addictions, can be good things as well. Right? We can be addicted to something that we do, which can be good things, like people work long hours. You know, that can be addicted to long hours of work, right? You know, or they may have a, a task or a job or a thing that they do. I mean, people are kind of addicted to things. You know, there are people who hoard things, they keep things at home. They're addicted to those items, right? So, so there's a, a lot of things you know, that people do outside of the general addiction that we know of. So let's kind of talk a bit about alcohol for a moment. You know, so when people have alcoholism, what kind of symptoms do they get, or what kind of difficulties they might get? Uh, they can, uh, at least the main thing is they can go through withdrawal from the uh, from alcohol. Uh, sometimes they will want to, sometimes they may be drinking in the morning, early in the morning, so they may have an addiction with that. Why do they drink in the morning? Because it, it is something to reach for. Right, that's one, and do they, sometimes they may, people can get some like withdrawal symptoms? Mm -hmm. you know, what are the withdrawal symptoms like from alcohol? Uh, they can have fever, they can have vomiting, shaking, um, moving, tendency to move a lot. Okay. Restless. Restlessness. Okay. Um, they can um, not be able to function at work, at school, or at home, or anything like that. And they might have aggression, anger issues, and they might just be able to Okay, so we're looking at two different kind of categories. Now, one is the psychological withdrawal of an addiction. The other is the physiological, right? You know, the psychologicals are anger, agitation, and whatnot. You know, if you want to say a bit more about some of the potential symptoms of um, alcohol dependence and/or withdrawal, so let's kind of pick up dependence first. Dependence. Oh, um, so you can build up tolerance where you need more alcohol to get the same effects. Mm -hmm. um, you might not be able to meet all your obligations at work, put yourself in hazardous situations, mm -hmm. um, and you spend a lot more time trying to acquire alcohol and more um, duration using alcohol, mm -hmm. um, and you're still going to use it even though there's adverse effects. Right. So people keep on doing the thing in spite of knowing there's not that the person is a bad mother or a father or a son or a daughter. They just know it, but they cannot let go of that. You know? And that's so very powerful. Right? Okay. So, so the power of addiction is so very huge. Right? You know? Okay. So, and that should be true for even narcotics or any kind of an addiction. So we just saw somebody from a student. He is using marijuana. So he's marijuana dependent and uh, um, he is a motivated energetic you know, he could not continue his schooling his father brought him in and he goes I don't know what to do I just don't have any motivation to do anything and he knows that it's affecting his life but still he does not know what to do about that so those are the kind of stuff you know so so addictions can be that powerful so what do we do about that so psychological let's talk about psychological part of the addiction so biological is you know why is bio understanding biology is important for us to know? Because, say, alcohol biology of withdrawal or dependence, why would that be important as a clinician to know that? Because we need to treat their symptoms. Okay. Otherwise, they'll never become, they'll never stop using that substance. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, was there somebody with me when we were seeing a couple who had, mm -hmm. you were with me, right? So, um, so, that couple were struggling with alcoholism. Why were they struggling with alcoholism? You know, what were there some of the you you don't have to give too much of detail, but there's some psychological reason, right? Mm -hmm. Well, share? there's there could be some genetic factor, like if your parent was an alcoholic, or um, like if one if it's like environmental, like if you can't get out of like if all your friends drink and all your friends go to the bar and that's what you do. You kind of have to take yourself out of that situation in that environment because it's like a psychological trigger. Absolutely, so a bar. So, have you seen people at the bar? Have you ever gone to a bar? <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really. Right? Well, we can take you to the bar just to make you sure that you know what the bar looks like. I'm good. <laughs> 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 Just checking in. You know? <laughs> yeah, so, so, bar, the environment plays a role. Right. Okay, so very, very good. What else do you want to share about that? Um, just that, you know, you have to 
have the support system to get through it. So if one's asking for alcohol, you kind of need someone to be there for you to support you not drinking as opposed to kind of enabling and helping provide the alcohol. Absolutely. So if somebody <clears throat> gives an alcoholic some money, somebody gives a gambler some money and send them to attend a conference in Las Vegas, what do you think they would do? <laughs> Gamble. Gamble, right? You know, so we have to know not to feed into their habits, right? As family members or caregivers and those kind of stuff. And changing the environment is powerful. Um, but why do I also want to know what? Why do biology of say alcoholism or narcotics or others helps us as treaters to help people treat them better? So what happens biologically speaking if somebody is alcohol dependent when they are not taking alcohol? What would happen to their bodies? They can have like delirium tremens. Right, and delirium tremens is the seizures and the shakes. See the shake that's what you imagine you talked about. You know, the mm -hmm. seizures and the shakes are because people have delirium, right? You know, and it's a lethal condition. People can die from that. You know, so so generally speaking, all these substances can be divided into a few categories for the sake of understanding. Sedative hypnotics. Mm -hmm. you know, sedative hypnotics are mm -hmm. which are more sedating. You know, it helps people calm down. So just understand when people are not taking sedative hypnotics, what would they be like? They will be agitated. Right? It's the exact opposite of what the medicine is doing or the drug is doing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. On the other hand, if there are some things which are stimulants, what are some of the stimulants that people use? Amphetamine. Amphetamine. What else? Cocaine. Cocaine. Well, let's stick with these two. So amphetamines and cocaine are stimulants. So if somebody is not taking stimulants, mm -hmm. how would they be? If they are not getting their drug, how would they be, generally speaking? Normal or they're, uh, depressed? Depressed, right? And it's the exact opposite of that, you know. So, knowing the state of intoxication or what the medicine does or the drug does gives you an idea of if they're not taking it, mm. they will be the exact opposite of that. They'll be more depressed, more you know, motivated, they don't want to get out of the home, you know, those kind of stuff, you know. Okay. So, treatments. Uh, we talked about, you know, the environment as being a treatment. So, what do we do uh, in regards to um, medicine, some of the medicinal sciences here? To help people with their recoveries and getting better. Uh, with alcoholism, you can use anti abuse. Mm -hmm. um, you can also use some benzos to calm their agitations okay. and true. some dining for the That's nutrition. True. Okay, so there are two aspects. One is the withdrawal symptoms, the acute withdrawal. That's where you know, you'll be using something to help them get out of that thing. You know, so we you can use any benzodiazepine and thiamine and those kind of stuff. But then there's a long term treatment. Because getting detox is not the treatment, right? It's just getting getting started with the treatment, you know. But but treatments really are over a period of time. And what does that involve? So there are treatments for alcohol, there are treatments for narcotics. What do we use here more commonly for narcotics? We use Suboxone. Suboxone, you know, it's a very powerful medicine to help people withdraw from their narcotics, right? You know, okay. So so we use medicinal sciences, and when people are clean and getting better. What else begins to emerge in their life, James? The rest of the issues that the drugs and the alcohol clouded. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> so you come out of the dream state, <laughs> you know, and begin to see what else is happening in our brain and body, you know. So, so people who tend to eat or who tend to run away from their problems by doing something, and I just use eating as a symbolism of, of feeding our addictions, you know. And, and, and our drama, the brain, you know, and those are, you know, things which are traumatizing and difficult. We're giving our brain something to be okay, but that is not okay because it doesn't solve the issues, right, you know. I mean, today we were talking about, I was talking to somebody who was beginning to have nightmares and dreams, and I said, it's a good stuff. She goes, no. Who was with me when we were talking to one of the person who said, I, I have, I'm having all these dreams. Oh, that was me. Yeah, it was beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. and all the dreams. And where did I talk about the dreams and the brain's activity? A free movie of your life <laughs> <laughs> to enjoy. It's a free movie of your life to enjoy, you know, because that drama is playing, right? And so, and so in treatment-wise, we divide treatments into three different perspectives, you know. Uh, biological treatments, that's which improves all the medicine. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, name me one more medicine for alcoholism that we use. Do you use set antibiotics? One more. 
Um, for long term relapse prevention. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Start with the C like a cat. Sounds like one more. Oh, Cataprest is okay. That's for detox. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, Campro. Campro. They all sound like, you know, it's like cat. Campro. <laughs> so we use that for people to prevent them from relapsing. So they're very powerful medicines which are very helpful in recovery. Uh, and then, so we use them at Seclear at the onset of our treatment model. But what else do we do here in addition to just giving people medicines? Uh, we do different groups here. We have the yogas. Uh, we do mindfulness exercises. We do deep breathing exercises, which I think is very effective. And we have we have the uh, Native American on Wednesdays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays here. So the first experience that was pretty interesting, and uh, I think that works a lot. No. That's good. That's good. That's very good. So let's talk a bit about the the the, the wonders of what you, James, do here and what you offer. Traditional counseling method, methods have tended to be harsh and direct. Here at Seclair, we view recovery as a process and not necessarily an event. Uh, we use dialectical behavioral therapy incorporated with uh, person-centered counseling, which centers around the three areas of uh, empathetic, being congruent, and unconditional positive regard, where the counselor is genuine and honest, where you have empathy and try to look at the world through the person's perspective, and unconditional positive regards being non-judgmental. Uh, we, we don't necessarily have to accept the behavior. We always accept the person. Wonderful. Very well said. Very well said. And so when somebody comes in and meets the person at the front desk, how would you treat them? With respect. And With respect. Yeah. And? Dignity. And dignity. You know, respect and dignity is the first fundamental principle. Because people may have difficult challenges. Who doesn't? And then being able to guide them through the process of finding their way of life. Right? You know? So most people don't wake up and say, I'm going to leave my wife, go to jail, you know, have to pay a fine and, and, and be a disgrace for my family, right? Nobody does that. You know, none of us want to do that. You know, all of us want to have a family life, ability to have integration, some respect and dignity, and really have a joy and balance of life, right? You know, those are the inner, the very common basic premises of every human being's wanting, and everybody wants that. Sometimes you just don't know how to get that. You know? uh, and, and anybody has aspired to have a heart attack? Mm -hmm. I will have the best heart attack in the world. Nobody, but people do have heart attacks, right? So in this world, we have a lot of people who are cardiovascular, you know, events or uh, you know, matters are the leading cause of difficulties in U.S. Actually, all around the world, and yet nobody wants to have it, but we have it, right? Okay. So part of our uh, goals are to allow people to return to have a healthy, balanced life, and 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 giving them the tools, knowledge, and the ability to do that is the way we. Incorporate those and in their everyday, you know, life changes. So you know that we are, you know, you kind know, of giving them and guiding through that. So since you folks have been here as observers of the processes, what have you noticed in addiction treatment that that comes to your mind as a, as an experience of working with people as, as we practice it here? One thing that I've noticed that, is that we're very non-judgmental, and I think that it's important to educate patients on their medications and some of the patients that I've met here didn't even know that opiates are addictive yet they're being prescribed it. So I think it's very important to educate patients on the medications that they're giving and how to take them appropriately. Okay, so education is a yeah. huge thing right yeah. now. You, have you seen any of anything that was, was of interest? In? I think it's important to respect the patients taking Suboxone and ask them like if they think they're ready to decrease the dosage or the frequency as opposed to kind of push them mm -hmm. to do so because I think if you push them then they're more likely to relapse. I think listening to them and bumping it down when they're ready is effective. And listening to them you get an A plus almost. <laughs> <laughs> listening to people is very important. You know. What's your observation? Um, I would say that it's not just treating the addiction, but looking at the whole person 
um, you know, if they're depressed, trying to help them talk them through that or the anxiety. So it's more of a holistic approach. Absolutely. So on the holistic approach, we finish this session because that's what we believe. We believe uh, prevention, integrating medicine, medical sciences into everyday living is the goal. And that is not only by a pill that comes in a bottle. It's a wisdom that gradually trickles into people's lives over a period of time. And so we become the the the, um, the conduit to assist people to get their lives back. Um, we are not it. We are just part of that processes. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, our next topic um, would be uh, foods and microbiomes and joints. So we're talking about that next time. That's our topic. So whoever is stuck with us <laughs> should be reading up on a very different subject matter. <laughs> Thank you for our team. This is the best of a team as it gets in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Swen and Mike and the background drama that goes on to make these things possible. We really appreciate that. Thank you.